you know, this is so I, I imagine for him, because I had to go through this when I was younger, the substitute teacher battle. Oh, I going through school. Isn't your your name is Cedric Phillips? That's the that's like one of the easiest names to pronounce. You right? would think that. You would think that. And then that's when people start calling you Cedric, which is a disaster <laughs> because does anyone know anyone named Cedric? No. Thank you. And then they have to try to spell your name, which is a delight because it always starts with an S for the substitute teacher. I imagine for Solomon, I can't imagine how people used to say his last name. So this strikes me as a pretty rough matchup for Jeremy game one. Uh, I don't think it's great. I don't think it's great. I mean, and Hostilities is a five mana wrath, and I think that's the big problem. Matchbot has an Eidolon to start things off, so he didn't have a one drop to really get things going. He's going to attack with the Eidolon for two and put Bylander down to 19. Now he's got a one drop in Foundry Denizen. Don't know if he has a follow-up after that. He's just going to pass the turn back here. But I definitely agree with you. I think that game one is probably pretty tough, but I think it's pretty simple for things to get better after sideboard. That's how things do work for blue-white control often. You know, the game one matchup against beatdown decks is just not going to be great. You see a bunch of divinations right now in Jeremy's hand. So bad in the face of the Eidolon. But post-board, with the right mixture of next place Rams and Last Breaths and things along those lines, you can get it cleaned up. Flood Strand's going to put Bylander down to 18. Search of Planes out of the deck. And we'll see what Bylander wants to do in this turn. He does have a divination in his hand, so there's the potential for that to be cast. It'll cost two, though, because of the mighty Eidolon out there. And Banish Light, okay, well, that'll be two as well. Sure. Either this way. is much better than casting a divination on the third turn. I'm inclined to agree with you. Mousepout will untap and draw a card here. Ah, yes. The, that is the... Uh, it's your good friend, Marauder. the Marauder. Oh, yeah. I was going to say Minotaur, but that's a different creature. Borderland Marauder. Have you got to work with that thing yet? Not yet, but I've, I've had so many good memories with uh, Goros Chainwalker that I can't wait to play with this card. <laughs> Divination going to be cast. The Chainwalker was so bad. I don't know. Got to cast something off your burning emissary. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm out in the draw here for Machpop. He's going to get in here for four. That's so much damage. It's not, not that's, a lot of damage. That's three. Finally, we're going to draw a card here. Vanishing Light to draw. There's a Temple of Enlightenment. Looks like that's land number five. That's just so much damage. <laughs> you know? Just a great deal. That's three. Finally, wants to make sure he's going to keep that on top. And now Jeremy's probably going to kill it with something. Yeah, that's, what are we even talking about that's here? That's unbelievable. The value that has been gained there. Just ban, should we just ban the Marauder, you think? Too good? Probably not. No. Got some nice body armor and a nice axe. Can't say that. There's a banishing light. Yep. Got him. Beautiful. Here's a lightning strike going upstairs. Bylander's going to go down to seven. Ash probably going to draw a card. There's a mountain. What is this? Oh, boy. Ooh. There's the Phoenix. Well, we're going to take a look at that. Because this is a little bit scary. The Flame Wrath Phoenix. See, Bylander's taking a look. So, 5-5 five, five Flyer or 3-3 three, three that comes back. Two good deals. Ah, well, there are two very different deals. And that's part of the problem with the Tribute mechanic is it's both the deals have to be good at the same time for the card to be powerful. And that's not going to be the case all the time. Well, Jeremy's certainly in a bit of a bind here on what he wants to have happen with the Flame Wrath Phoenix. Tribute. So there's an attack for two because the red creature came into play. Yeah, with Jeremy's hand having Elspeth, I guess he's forced to just make this a 5 5 with the intent of playing Elspeth and Minusing. Well, he drew the sixth land. Also, if he draws end hostilities, then he just kills it, yeah. which is another another factor. There's Elspeth. And there's the Minus. It's going to take care of the Phoenix. Oh, there's an attack for one. Yeah, that's going to do it. So, Solomon Mashpal is going to win this game over Jeremy Bylander. Thinks that stoked the Flames. Mono Red Aggro currently up a game here over Blue White Control. 
what I would expect to be a good matchup, especially given Jeremy's construction here. Looks like he's trying to fight other control decks for the most part. I think that game one is terrible for Jeremy. Yeah. Like, like, absolutely horrible. Now, if he does have access to cards like Nixley's Ram, spoiler alert, mm -hmm. he does, or Brahma's, spoiler alert, he does, then things get a lot better. He's got four Nixley's Ram, two Brahma's, two Wingmate Rock, two Negate, a Devouring Light, and a Race, a, ugh, a Resolute Archangel, a Faded Retribution, <laughs> and a Disdainful Stroke. So that's four Rams, two Brahma's, two Rocks is eight. Uh, Resolute, Angel, Resolute Archangel is probably nine. And then you can get a little more creative if you want to with Negates or Devouring Light. So a lot of options here for Jeremy. I don't know if Wingmate Rock is quite the right card for this matchup, but it probably comes in. I think it probably comes in. Attack with the Ram. I know. I know you can attack and with the Ram. get him. He just doesn't have a lot of creatures. It's, it's surprising to see it in a sideboard to begin with, because he's not really attacking with that much. But it's probably still better than a lot of the other tools he has, because he has a lot of anti-control cards in his deck. What do we see on Bylander's side? Three copies of Harness by Force, two Chandra Pyromaster, two copies of Magma Spray, two War Name Aspirin, two copies of Searing Blood, a Hammer Perforos, a Prophetic Flame Speaker, a fourth copy of the Flame Rift Phoenix, and a Temple of Abandon. So I like bringing in the Prophetic Flame Speaker quite a bit. I like the one copy of Hammer Perforos. And I think the War Name Aspirins are fine here too. They can attack through Nick's Fleece Ram and Elspeth Tokens as well. Being able to attack through the Ram is a big game. Yeah, and the Chandras. The Chandras will be good here, too. Now, the, the problem with the Aspirin is just kind of like a... It's like a Nambo in the red decks because of a card like Fonda Tree Denizen. It's not great, but it, it's rare that that sequencing matters too, too much. And the Aspirin is pretty good against a lot of Jeremy's defensive tools. Can't be hit by Last Breath, assuming that you've filled Raid. And really hard to block with the type of the cards that Jeremy's likely to bring to the table. Okay. Well, both players shuffling up here for game number two. It'll be underway in just a moment. And while we do wait, we will talk about our 2015 Invitational schedule. It's going to look very similar to what you guys have seen this year for 2014 on the Open Series. We are replacing Charlotte with Richmond, and otherwise, same venues in the same order. Imagine that means that Columbus will be held alongside the Origins Game Fair, which is a big gaming convention. Very cool thing to see. And then New Jersey and Seattle to close out the year. New Jersey will be held alongside a fire alarm. It, do you think that's, you think that's what's going to happen? Anywhere. They can go off anywhere. Okay. And then Seattle will be the season four one again. Yeah. So that'll be fun. Be nice. And then we'll be going to Richmond instead of Charlotte, as you did mention. So there it is for 2015. The Open Series not going anywhere. It's going to be an exciting year next year. It's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, it, it, the Open Series and the Invitationals have done nothing but grow over the last couple of years, and I expect 2015 to be more of the same. Well, game number two is going to be underway here between Moshpaw and Bylander in just a moment. Again, I do think that for Jeremy, game one is ugly, as he got crushed pretty badly there, even though Moshpaw did stumble on lands a little bit. But... We'll see if things do change here in his favor again. He's got some cards that are a real pain in the butt for Red and Nick's Fleece, Ram, and Vermont. Got to draw him on time, though. That's true. That's true. Probably it's mulligan aggressively, too. A little interesting to see, again, blue-white here instead of blue-black. Black has some really nice cards afforded to in Heroes Downfall, Thoughtseize, Ashiok, if you're a fan of that card. You've got Urborgs to make your mana a little bit better. Murderous Cut as well. For the white splash here, we see... You know, you've got your end hostilities, four of those, so you do have your mass removal effect. Banishing Light is a nice catch-all. Last Breath as well. And, of course, Elspeth is a very nice win condition. I do wonder what splash color is better between black or white. I would be very scared about playing blue-white just because of Storm Breath Dragon. That's a card that's picking up in popularity because it's pretty good against Obzon, and a lot of Jeremy's defensive cards don't do any work against Storm Breath Dragon. So I, would, I think right now I'd rather be casting Heroes Downfalls than Banishing Lights. Both players will lay out seven cards here again. Bylander will be on the play. Game number two just about underway. Both these players starting off 3-0 with their unique builds of their decks. Did not expect to see blue-white control in this room today. Though I do expect to see a lot of two-color control decks, another reasonable response to all the mono-red in the room. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a good avenue to be going. I know we saw Greg Orange a little bit earlier playing Esper, uh, very close to the same deck he played at Pro Tour Concertark here. See on hostilities in the grip here. Looks like only two lands here for Bylander as Moshfile's going to take in Mulligan. Josh Not happy with what he's Looks like he was on a one land hand and he already had a Phoenix in hand. So the Phoenix is already kind of a mulligan on a, a hand with only one land in it. And if the rest of his hand wasn't that exciting, then might as well send it back. How dare you talk about the Phoenix negatively? I well, like this card. I want this card to be good. Again, I think... No way for it to get haste, though. Mm, that's kind no. of a dagger all around. Yep. Yeah. Between this and Ashkel, I do think the Ashkel is probably the better of the two. The problem is there's so many matchups right now where your opponent can just go, all right, 
it resolves, it's a 5-5, kill it with something. Yeah. That's the biggest problem. Flame Red Phoenix is much better in, say, a Red Aggressive Mirror because both modes of this card are more powerful than Ash Cloud Phoenix. That's true. That's but true. against the, the Obzons of the world, I would definitely want Ash Cloud Phoenix. The most important thing about those two cards, though, is that they fly. Yes. That's the big deal because it gets you around Siege Rhino. Correct. But it is very easy to answer Flame Red Phoenix with all sorts of just random removal spells. Another mulligan here for Solomon. That yep. was a one lander that he sent back. Another one lander with Rabble Master and Phoenix again. Mm -hmm. So, kind of already mulliganed. How many lands does he have? 20. Okay. More than the builds we've seen, not only today, but last weekend, last weekend in Worcester as well. Last weekend we saw a lot of 17 land builds. So, he's got extra lands to supplement these four drops. 20 is still a little bit on the light side for a deck that's playing four, uh, three copies of a, of a four drop. It's a little light. It's also got, I mean, the three mana spells too, they need to come on time. You know, so the Hall of Triumphs and the Goblin Rabble Masters of the world, they're time sensitive. Absolutely. Do you like the bigger approach of the red deck or do you like the 17 land super low? I think that I, I would probably try to start somewhere here because I think people have adapted too much to the Tom Ross school at this point. Okay. You're definitely going to be playing against Drowned Sorrows and Anger of God. So if you can find threat bases that go a little bit bigger, and are resistant to those kind of removal spells, I think you're going to be better served. All right, let's see if Mashpa can find a five-card hand that he is happy with. And there's at least one land again. It actually looks like there are two. There's also a Stoke the Flames over there. It's not the best hand, but he will have to keep it. And he's going to start off with a Foundry Denizen, so a little bit of aggression to start off here. Bylander draws a card. For Maz is what he found for his draw step. There's an island, and just passing the turn back over to Mashpao. Draws another Phoenix. This is an attack for one. Those damned Phoenixes. Yeah, they are here in mass for game number two between the Mulligans and his draw steps. Bindlander will draw. Temple of Enlightenment comes off the top. Take a look at the top card. Looks like he's going to leave it on top very, very quickly with the last breath at the ready. Attack for one. Bylander going to go down to 18. Pass the turn back. Yep, fire off the last breath. Keep things clear. I really like this play from Jeremy because he's probably going to untap and land Vermaz. So what's the reason to get rid of that Foundry Denizen? Well, to keep Solomon off of Stoke the Flames. Mm -hmm. Don't let any nonsense happen to your 3-4 that can win the game on its own. Borderland Marauder shows up off the top of the deck. Bylander will draw a card, another copy of Flooded Strand. That was his draw last turn, so running lands there for Jeremy. He will sacrifice both. He's going down to 16. There's a Plains. There's an Island. So man online for the two-color deck. And we'll see what the play is here. But it is going to be hard for Solomon to beat Vermaz. Yep. The standard story for red aggressive strategy since Vermaz has been printed. I actually think what Bylander has here is a Prognostic Sphinx. So there that is. Here's an attack. For three, along with the kitty cat. He says, I'm just going to eat the kitty cat, if you don't mind. So the way that goes, three damage will come across. Of course, Marauder is actually a 1-2 fire driver state of the draw here. But this is the issue with the red decks, is when you get into a longer game against these control strategies, or even against the mid-range strategies, when they're at 16, it's a little too hard to come back. I'm not even showing Jeremy another card. If I'm Solomon, I'm picking up my cards and go to the next game. Don't want to give away any info? There's nothing to be gained here. There's no, I don't think Solomon could stack his deck and win this game. So just got to let it go. Makes at least ram the draw here for Bylander. There's certainly, I, I, uh, the only counter argument to that, and I agree with you, is there's information to be gained on Solomon's side about what Jeremy has potentially. That is true. I don't think there's a ton because I think you can put him on a range of cards, but it's nice knowing for sure that he has Nick's Fleece Ram. Though, I'm not sure how much that information actually helps you because I'm not sure that he can actually beat it. Well, it is, it is good to know. For example, maybe Solomon took out his, his two copies of Titan Strength and maybe he can bring those back in if he wasn't sure about Nick's Fleece Ram. Sure, sure. See the attack here and, of course, the Scry with the Prognostic Sphinx. The old Scry 3 on the 3-5 flyer. I was probably going to draw a copy of Eidolon of the Great Revel. Sweet. <laughs> well, it is powerful. I'm going to slam that bad boy into play. Maybe. Yes. In comes the 2-2. Two -two. Try to double block with... Double block the Vermaz, I guess. 
gonna get him. Next loose ram trigger. Bylander gonna gain a life. Hey, let's get another one off this Tranquil Cove. And we'll work our way into the attack stop here in just a moment. I think that, you know, in the coming month or so, or two months, maybe at the Invitational in Seattle, I think we're going to see more Prognostic Sphinx. I think this card is really underplayed right now. Seems pretty well suited to fighting Obzon. As long as that's the talk of the town, I think you're going to see it. Attack that remains in to be the seen. air. Scry three action, and of course, Bramas coming in too. Two to the bottom, one on top of the Scry. This looks like there's your block. I just think that, you know, with how good that card was at the Pro Tour, Pro Tour Journey Nix, and for it to see such, you know, such little play now, it's a little bit surprising. It lines up very well against certain threads. Yeah. Five toughness is a great spot to be in. Yep. Block that Siege Rhino for days, doesn't care about Stoke the Flames. Ash Cloud Phoenix. Yeah. Can't forget about Stormbreath Dragon, too. See, Stoke the Flames is going to take care of Maz. Bylander going to draw a card here very quickly. Looks like a wingmate rock. So, yeah, there's definitely some information to be gained here because now he's, uh, Mashpa is also going to see wingmate rock, I think, in just a second. Eh, Jeremy doesn't need to cast it. I mean, Salmon's basically locked by his own Eidolon and probably can't kill a Prognostic Sphinx. Yeah, there is the rock, and I think for if you're Jeremy, you are giving away a little bit of information there because he does not need to cast that to win the game. Yeah, he's Solomon's just already locked by the prognostic sphinx. So Solomon got paid off a little bit for continuing to play the game out. So uh, good on him. I do think that the thing now for Solomon, now that he does have the information that okay, he's got prognostic sphinx, he's got wingmate rock, he's got some cards I'm scared of, is that I have to mulligan aggressively into really aggressive hands. Because the longer the game goes, it, it's over. And, you know, he probably already thought that, you know, because he's playing against a control deck, but now he knows for sure that if we go to, like, turn five or turn six, the chances of me winning are pretty slim. Correct. That was the case kind of anyway. The only card that I think fluctuates in value based on the cards they saw is maybe he's more inclined to bring in Titan Strength. Yeah, I think that probably does come back now, if it was boarded out at all. Yeah, which I think is reasonable to board out, but Jeremy has shown enough things that, that Salmon really wants to punch through that Titan Strength will do some work. Well, both players will shuffle up here for game number three. And while we do wait, we will talk about our furry friend, number four in our Squirrel series, Squirrel Confidant. That's recently been added to a collaborative playmat that will be given out in regionals this coming winter. You see the squirrel here hanging out up to no good and get these tokens every time you sign up for a Legacy Open, you get two of them. And if you want to buy the dice bags or play mats or sleeves or deck boxes, head over to starcitygames.com now. Go check it out. Some people are wondering if this is the end of the Squirrel series since this is the end of 2014. We don't know. Yeah. We're kept in the dark about these things. We just, you know, we, we get told at a show one day that we got we to gotta talk about our good friends here, the Squirrel family. These promotions, they just pop up on the screen. We got to talk about them. I get scheduled to work Friday nights at Grand Prix. Just find about that when the ad goes live. Yeah. You better, not, you better be there. Not, I'm not really kept in the loop here. So. You better be there or else. If you want information, I can't help you because I'm kept in the dark. Hopefully we'll have more squirrel things. But we could have the turkey series. I'm waiting for the, out. We are, I'm still waiting for the hippo series. Oh, the, the, the killer creature collection series? Yes. Yeah, we still have a little bit of work to do, I think, on that. Yeah, well, it was a, it, initial talks. In, internally, it was a tough sell. Yep. But I think there's still time to get everyone on the same page. Now, do we go with Hippo or do we go with Feldegriff? Hippo. Yeah? Hippo. Okay, but like a cartoonish sure. Hippo. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. Yeah. I would be okay at this point settling for a giraffe as well. Not dangerous enough. Not lethal enough. True. True. Make a very good point. And see, we can't do a rhino now because Siege Rhino is such a, a big Taking deal. Taking up all that design space. Yeah, so that design space it. is just gone now at this point. So really, you know, Hippo has been left alone and it's wide open for us to kind of take over that market. Yeah, basically not represented in, in Magic's robust menagerie. We should investigate this. I'm a little surprised, too, by the way, that there are not more hippos just running around. No, I agree. And we can't do elephants either, because there's like the loxodon. Yeah. And so elephants are kind of... I think hippo is the only thing left besides squirrels that we could do. Can't really think of any other safari animals. Yeah. Assuming that hippos hang out in safaris. Uh, you have to keep them caged up because those things will just kill people. <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they're in zoos and stuff. Well, they are violent. We know yeah. that. We could have a snake series. There really aren't a lot of magic snakes. 
Uh, that, no, they, I, I guess that's true. You would think that there would be more snakes right. in Magic, but really, most of the snakes... What's the best snake creature in Magic history? I have to think about that. Like Mystic Snake, maybe? Mystic Snake's probably... It is not Snake Basket. Mass Asp? It's not... Just stop. What is wrong with you? I'll have to think about it some. See, Tranquil Cove is going to bring Jeremy up to 21. Jeremy's kept a very slow hand here. He kept a two-lander. He, fortunately for him, drew a third land uh, a, fir a third land on his first draw set, but a lot of five-mana spells in his deck. Or his hand, rather. A little risky. Can yeah, you I run mean, out of the gym here? Elspeth, Wingmate Rock, and Hostilities. Oof. Not a lot of defense here. Watch by a two-drop. He does. There's the Eidolon. All right. I mean, Jeremy does have a last breath, but... He's got, he's got take, a lot of fives in his hand right now. He's got to take two to cast it now. Let's see what the draw is. Copy of Temple of Enlightenment. There's a little bit of attention there. Does he want to play that or not? I think he has to last breath this turn. He can't just take this hit. I mean, it's tough because his next lands are both comes into play tap. So, you know, the Devouring Light in his hand, he probably can't cast on turn three unless he rips a land. But I don't think he can just take this hit. This is why you see him taking so long on this turn. Am I supposed to play an untapped land plus last breath? Am I supposed to play a tap land? If I do play a tap land, do I play Tranquil Cove or Temple of Enlightenment? And it looks like he's going to go with the untapped land and maybe hope to peel an untapped one next turn. Yeah. So there's your planes. And also he has to be a little bit careful too because he probably has to cast last breath now. It's really risky because if Solomon has something like Titan Strength in response to this last breath, you can just about lock this game up. I know he wants to get fancy because you, ha you have a hope, you know, maybe he has some creature enchantment in his deck or something, but... Yeah, the other red decks have cards like Dragon Mantle and Hammer Hand and stuff like that where you can kind of get them. Yeah. But he's just going to cast the Last Breath on his main phase. I think that's wise. He's got, yeah, there's nothing to be gained by waiting, and the risk is just too high. I'm being told that Sakura Tribelder is the best snake. That's probably it's a good true. snake. It's probably true. Coiling Oracle also in the snake debate. Ah, right, Lotus Cobra. We, sure. should, we should just be fired. And oh. by we, I mean me. Lotus Cobra's a good choice. There's an attack for just two, no pump. You saw the Temple of Abandon. Is there a follow-up? All right, there is. There's another Eidolon. Do we like Eidolon a lot in this matchup? I think it's fine. It's, it's not great, but, you know, it, I would be hard-pressed to cut it. You see, this is the cost. You saw his draw step for the turn was Bramaz. This is the cost of, you know, one, having a lot of coming to play tap lands in your deck and opting to go with the untapped last breath last turn instead of the tap land plus Bramaz this turn. And now, I think, of course, he didn't know he was going to draw Bramaz. Exactly. I think if Bramaz is in hand, then that's an argument for saying, all right, I'll take my lumps this turn and try to play Bramaz on three. But without it in hand, I think he just has to play the last breath. Got to pump up the jam there on the Fire Drinker Seder, come across for five. Will Solomon. I think he actually has a follow-up play, too. He might have a Borderland Marauder. He's going to have to sacrifice that fetch land to get a Mountain out of his deck, and it is a Marauder. And this is kind of the nice thing when you're playing these aggressive red decks, because when you're playing against blue-white, you know that there is no Wrath effect on four man anymore. Now, if he's playing against blue-black, he has to be conscious of a card like Drown and Sorrow. If he's playing against blue-red, he has to worry about Anger of the Gods. But now, he not to really worry about anything. Yeah, it's a total, total freebie for him to extend as much as he wants to. So Bylander's down to 11 here. Moshpal's made the most of his mana just about every turn. Jeremy's going to draw a card. It's an untapped land. And a couple months ago, I'd be talking about Jace Architect without a Supreme Verdict. But both those cards are long gone. Yeah, now it may just be Bermaz. There's Temple of Enlightenment. Take a look at the top card here with Bylander. He's got decisions on the scry. He's got his next couple turns set up if you can get out of this okay. You know, he gets Bramaz plus Devouring Light and Hostilities, Elspeth. This is the turn he's got to cross his fingers and just hope nothing too bad happens. Isn't that what everyone says when they lose to the red deck? Yep. Ah, I got the next couple turns all set up. Just didn't make it to the next couple ones. It only counts as card advantage once you cast them. Yep. The act of drawing the cards doesn't count yet. Hey, turns five, six, and seven are locked up. Yeah, we got you know, him. Then, then we got him. That's easy. 
I got Mythic Rares to cast. You got no shot to win. But can he get there is the question. There's Bramaz. Two damage dealt, so Byler's going to go down to nine. And a very quick untap here from Ashpao. He will draw a card. We'll see if he has a card like Stoke the Flames. Looks like he may have a lightning strength. Lightning strike, excuse me, in the grip. But this is still fine. Jeremy might be compelled to block the Fire Drinker Seder here because it's just too much damage to let come across. Takes Solomon's turn and then end hostilities to clean up the board. And then hopefully for Solomon, you can finish off with some burn spells. Here's the big attack. <laughs> what will Bylander block is the question. The most damage potentially that can be dealt is by the Fire Drinker Seder. Correct. Just because of the two pumps. The flip side is you just block the Marauder and then you have you can attack with the Baraz next turn and generate a token that they can check the Fire Drinker Seder. And your Baraz blocks the Eidolon and you can start deploying your fives. But you do take six points of damage falling to three if you, li if you block that way. And then Lightning Strike kills you on top of Stoke the Flames. The safest play for Jeremy to make in terms of preserving his life title is just block the Fire Drinker Seder, untap, and hostilities. He'll go to four, and then he has to fade Stoke the Flames or Running Burn spells. This we, is a very tough block. We do know that in these red decks, they don't play a lot of burn spells anymore. It's mostly just Lightning Strike and Stoke the Flames. That's typically all you'll see. Yeah, occasionally you'll see some copies of Searing Blood, but Salma has them in, their, in his main deck, but I imagine they have long since been cut. Chances are. So Bylander is taking a look at his hand again. He's got a Wingmate Rock over there and Hostilities and Elspeth too. And if this game were going more turns, this would be easy breezy for Jeremy. He's just got to figure out a way to make it so that the games do go. The problem here is turns. if he just blocks the Fire Drinkers here, he's not really extracting a lot of value out of this for Maz. He's just trading, and then he has a 1-1 against some two toughness creatures. Looks like he's going to block here. Yeah, and I think at this point... Salmon can just go ahead, dump all of his mana into the Fire Drinker Seder, have Jeremy fall to three, and then hopefully try to time this Lightning Strike somewhere down the line where it kills Jeremy. I'm just making sure it doesn't run into any counter magic. There's one pump. Got to give him one more. Yeah, I would, I would want to dump as much as I can into this, if possible. The, getting your opponent to three with Lightning Strike in hand is just such a great position to be in. Yeah. I would be surprised if he passes, passes up on the opportunity, though he is really thinking about it. You know, some of the cards in his hand are a mystery to us here in the booth and you guys at home, so. I mean, the thing is, he can go ahead, Lightning Strike the Vermaz, and then trade off. But then if if Jeremy has a follow-up here of End Hostilities or just more blockers, then, I mean, Salmon may not get another shot at this. Looks like it's going to be for five, so Violator's going to go down to four. Cat Token bites the dust. Marauder bites the dust. You see the strike in the grip. That'd be a real shame if Bylander ended this game at one. And he's going to strike the Bermaz, and yeah, I I'm with you. I, I just don't love the sequencing of this play where you have the potential to bring your opponent down to three with a lightning strike in your hand. And his last two cards, I think, are just lands. Yeah. So now he might be getting himself in the situation where he just has to hope to peel out. Banish and light the draw. Because the odds are so high when you have an Eidolon in play that your opponent's going to tap his mana for something big, then the shields are down and Lightning Strike finishes it off. Yep, there's a Rabble Master off the top of the deck there for Moshpal. All right, well, this is this works perfectly. Yeah, I mean, rewarded in a big way. There's the Goblin attack. Bylander's going to go down to three, and now he's back in Lightning Strike range. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, never mind. I, I, I'm still living in the world with the Lightning Strike and Solomon's hand. No, no, it's gone. It's gone. Whoa, don't let him untap. Yeah. <laughs> so a timely top deck there for Mashpow. I think Solomon's play is much more justifiable on that previous turn if he doesn't have the Eidolon. But the Eidolon compels Jeremy to tap out for something big. You yeah. can't cast something small. And then your lightning strikes in the clear. We need one player to report for this draft number seven. We need... Square Saltine at Gmail. Three mana. Please report. 
I mean, Jeremy's, banishing some light. Jeremy's hand's just not that efficient. It's just he's only in one spell a turn territory. There's an attack for one. Bylander's going to go down to two. Just pass the turn back. Bylander draws a card. Copy of Evolving Wilds. A touch wah, awkward. Wah, wah. Yep. <laughs> That's not untapped land number six. I mean, Prognosis Sphinx is not a bad consolation prize here, but I'm sure Jeremy would prefer to just land the Elspeth here. Might actually have to consider the rock, too. Prognosis Sphinx is so much safer. I guess he gets to untap and start attacking for one and gaining a little bit yeah, of life. Yeah, he gets to gain life, which I suppose it doesn't really keep him in range out of Stoke or uh, doesn't, doesn't keep him out of range of Stoke or Lightning Strike. So Evolving Wild's going to get sacrificed. So you saw Finishing Denison come off the top there for Solomon. If you're a Bylander, you're just trying to fade any draw, any, uh, any burn spell. Well, I guess this is somewhat better because what it allows Jeremy to do is play Elspeth next turn plus it. And then the following turn, the attack with Wingmate Rock plus the tokens pushes him out of range of everything. Yeah. Although I guess it's still three turns regardless. Like, Prognosis Sphinx into Wingmate Rock into attack and gain three, go up to five, is the same time as Wingmate Rock into Elspeth into, into attack. Into attack with that stuff, yeah. That's true. The Rock is going to attack again alive. Up to three, Skipoo. But still in Lightning Strike and Stoke range. Well, the Sun's Champion is here to stabilize the ground. So that Goblin Token and that Finder Denizen, well, they don't matter much anymore. All right, Solomon gets one, one look at it. Hiya! Fetch land. Gonna put that into play. I think that was the one look. And now Solomon, he is not catching up now because it's gonna be four, he's getting four here. That and I believe that the negate that Bylander just drew was the check mark. Yeah. I think that's probably what gets it done now. No burn spell off the top. Also, Bylander's going to go up to two. I have a life total. Elspeth's going to tick up again here. Three more tokens going to come into play. And if you're Bylander, yeah, I don't have to do anything else. Yeah, no rush. This is it for me. Life is pretty good here for Jeremy. Able to just hold on just enough. Mosh probably going to draw a card. Didn't get a great look at that. You know, for Solomon, as he drew, he drew a copy of Flame Breath Phoenix, I think when he goes back and watches this match, I think he'll see the mistake with the, with the Fire Drinker. You just have to get as much damage as you can when you have the opportunity. Yeah. Because as it stands, he ends up coming up one point short is what it looks like. And that doesn't actually end up being the case. It was just, you know, kind of mismanagement of the Fire Drunk Crusader and the Lightning Strike. It's very easy to look back at this game when you see Solomon's hand and board and just say, uh, you know, I flooded out. It's an easy instinct to go to, but I think the win was available here. Another Elspeth drawn, but that doesn't matter. Going to gain seven life now, and that is going to do it. Jerry Bylander is going to get out of this match alive over Solomon Moshpow. Two games to one, blue-white control taking down mono-red aggro. Very close matchup. There's a lot of play going on there. But Jeremy able to squeeze it out. I think Jeremy did a very good job of navigating those games. Yeah. And he's definitely got a lot of hate in this board. 